founder and CEO of Off Business and Oxizo. Can I have uh, Alok Mittal on stage, please? This session is powered by Client Associates. We thank them for their support. Alok. While we're waiting for Alok, let me introduce you to the next one that's going to come up. So for those of you who are not planning to stay back, hold on because the next one is going to be on how AI is changing the media and content playground forever. I think it's going to be a super interesting one because it's going to be with Priyanka and we'll have a lot of other people uh, who will actually be talking about how their companies are at the forefront of these changes taking place right now. If you haven't checked yet, do check out the stalls outside when you're on, on your way out. Uh, we have Alok here. Welcome, Alok. Can I invite Ashish Mohapatra? Can we have a big hand for them, please? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thanks, Ashish, for joining us here. Uh, you know, it's been a, a you know. A uh, day full of energy around right. everything from artificial intelligence to consumer brands. Uh, and, uh, you know, what we wanted to uh, touch upon with you, uh, you know, is as we innovate and as we scale aggressively, you know, what are the trade-offs that come up both from a consumer standpoint uh, and how, you know, um, you exercise responsibility towards that. But also, um, you know, there is this whole gray cloud over entrepreneurship where many companies that scale up then start to show fractures um, in governance uh, and so on. Uh, so that is the space we are going to explore a little bit in this discussion. Uh, but to kick it off, uh, you know, it would be just great for you to, you know, introduce yourself to the uh, audience, but also just how did you start the company and now two companies. Uh, so would love to kind of get a backdrop on uh, that story. Okay, thank you guys. If I can make a quick request for people sitting at the back, if you can just come up front, we'll feel the room is a little more fuller than it is right now. So it's a request. If you can, uh, we'll be good for the speakers on stage. Thank you very much. Thanks for taking the onus on yourself. Thank you. Okay, so I'm Ashish Mohapatra, as the name suggests. Uh, run a company called, started a company called Off Business with uh, a few of my other co-founders. Uh, Off Business is, a, is largely a B2B marketplace, began as a marketplace for raw materials, but over a period of time has now branched out into private labels of its own. If you can think of bulky raw materials like steel, polymers, chemicals, uh, that kind of stuff, um, that is what we do. We take it directly from where it is uh, manufactured or sourced from and give it off to largely SMEs. Over a period of time, we've also dabbled into processing, manufacturing and all that. That's how our private label journey has started. So that's off business for you. Um, started about seven years back uh, and about five years back we started our financing platform. Financing initially was captive to off business but over a period of time has now branched out to an extent that it is relevant for practically every other supplier of, uh, of goods of a certain kind. Uh, it also sees the dream of becoming a fully diversified financial services firm in the same ecosystem that we operate. So think old world, think commanding heights of the economy, think real dhanda, tier two India, that's where uh, our business is. And uh, yeah, glad to share uh, what I'll have to today. Thank you, Alok, for having me. And thank you for patiently listening in advance. Yeah, and uh, for those of you who might not have heard about B2B businesses because they are less sexy, 
Uh, Ashish has the distinction of being, I think, one of the very few people to have had two unicorns now running in parallel. Uh, so not one. Uh, so certainly something that is going right here. Um, so Ashish, uh, let's start with this. And you know, the the theme for today's event has been around artificial intelligence. And there's obviously been a lot of debate around how to build responsible AI, um, what kind of customer uh, issues can come up because many of these models that we build are black box models and so on and so forth. But the general trade-off of how you apply technology and ensure that you're being responsible towards customers has existed for a while. Would just love to get your views on, you know, how do you view that? Where do you think, you know, uh, some of these um, trade-offs are arising from? And as you have built businesses, uh, you know, how have you managed to juggle those? Uh, we would love to get some initial thoughts on that. So I think uh, as we have built technology, I'll tell you very specific to us, and I think it's very true to any other e-commerce platform, we've kind of faced two trade-offs. The first one was when we built a marketplace for ourselves, um, it typically has to be a diversified um, set of suppliers who actually get their own quota depending on how they do. Uh, on delivery timelines, on prices and stuff like that. But when you launch your own private labels, what happens is that there is this eerie kind of, I would say, uh, incentive to actually divert all the traffic towards yourself. Because in private labels, obviously, you make much more margin than you typically do while you are a marketplace. And hence, you have this incentive to actually make more margins, and, and that may spoil the health of the market in the long term, but what can happen in the short term is that all the traffic that is coming to you thinking that you are a, you know, um, you are an unvested house with, uh, with no literal vested interests or so, um, and uh, you will not really prioritize your own private labels, right? You look at Amazon and you see all their private labels figuring somewhere out in the list. Think of Amazon if everything that is private label would figure out top in the list. I think that's one place where we've kind of faced this conundrum about thinking about how do we think about margins versus uh, just equality as a, as, a, um, as a theme. I think the second place where uh, we've kind of felt it is much more recent, we just launched something on the, uh, we just launched something on the AI front, wherein we've built out a pricing algorithm where people can come in and check, uh, people can come in and check the prices of several raw materials, many categories that we are today present in. Now that also converts into leads for many suppliers on the platform. And there also we face this conundrum of saying that should we be taking those leads ourselves or not? I think as a classic marketplace, uh, to choose health of the marketplace and hence long-term benefit of the marketplace versus being a brand on the, being a popular brand on the marketplace is where we see it. So that's where we faced it. Happy to take any further questions yeah. on that. So, so I think that is a little bit of this, you know, hybrid marketplace challenge, so to say. Um, you know, one of the core driving ambitions behind both financing large businesses uh, and then building, you know, multiple large businesses is this winner takes all effect. Right, and uh, many times these businesses are built on early incentivization of suppliers, early incentivization of customers, because you want to get to that scale, you know, that creates the winner takes all uh, characteristic. Unfortunately, in many cases, what we've noticed is that once you get to that winner takes all or duopolistic uh, construct, uh, then your winner is not just taking all from the competitors, they're also taking all from the customers and the suppliers, and there's significant stress that starts to build amongst ecosystems that had nothing to do with that, uh, you know, upside, right? So we have seen this with gig workers, we have been, seen this with delivery partners, uh, we've seen this with suppliers on platforms. Um, as you think about, you know, what keeps the marketplace going, uh, how do you think about these trade-offs? So uh, we have a very simple mathematical kind of uh, algorithm that we've kind of come up with. Hmm. We've said that as long as uh, we are never more than a certain figure, uh, which actually is very true to that particular cross-section of the marketplace, uh, we are fine. So for example, uh, if you take our own, wherever our own private label products are available, we actually try to see that 
we never have more than 20% market share and 80% is always given out. So if we are reaching 20% over, let's say, a week, week is what we measure ourselves by, then we actually stop taking orders even if we are more competitive than the other suppliers. And this, not only do we follow, but we make sure that it is actually very, very clearly articulated and publicized on the platform. So that's one thing that we do. That's when we actually force us to, uh, ourselves to exit from the platform. So that's one. I think the second thing that we've done is that uh, we've told the suppliers on the platform in this particular example to, to actually match up to our own standards and we are very open to share as to what do we do which makes us a lot more competitive than others. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we've learned from them as well, vice versa is true as well and I think the value that gets created in terms of learning from each other is something that finally gets passed over to the customer because we have this policy of not making above a certain percentage any which ways, right? So everything beyond that gets passed off. So I think that is a, it's probably not so much technology oriented, but it's, I think, the internal discipline that we have to keep for ourselves to make sure that we act responsibly. Sure, sure. The, the second aspect I was mentioning was really around the ability for these marketplaces to be extractive over time. Right? right? And right. that's a margin question, much less a you know, share question. So you could be a pure marketplace. Uh, but at some point, uh, the, you know, the supplier base is so dependent on you. And I guess this happens in large businesses anyway. Right? So I'm not, I'm not debating that this is a unique phenomena for tech-led startups. But the winner-takes-all characteristic that we are running after in those businesses amplifies the extractive capability. Correct. Are you seeing good, good ways of managing that? Because at some level, you know, all of us are maximizing shareholder returns as well. So I understand why that happens. But no, are there good ways to kind of strike those thresholds? So the extractive one, I personally don't believe in Alok. The reason for that is that I believe that finally the house wins. Uh, a gambler may win or lose depending on when, where or when he's in the trade. But finally the house wins, which means that the market will finally win. So as close as you are to the being the house and not really the gambler, which means that you're not taking the share, but you're building a platform for everybody to play equally. Uh, I think just that fundamental belief, if you have, and that guides your actions across, it will make you true to, uh, and that's what we believe. We believe that, you know, uh, and one of the reasons why we are a private label, ideally we should not have been. The, one of the reasons why we are a private label because is we, we figured out that certain labels or suppliers actually could not grow at the same pace as what the platform needed them to, and hence are chipping in. And we truly believe that in certain cases, if labels are good enough, uh, you know, others have really taken off, then we'll probably sacrifice the label as well. So there is this deep-seated feeling within ourselves that finally, uh, we don't want to gamble. We want to be the house. No, and, uh, you know, I, I must tell the audience that uh, we, you know, in my business, we have experienced the uh, value system with which Ashish and his team runs the business. We have, we have partnered with them on credit. Yes. And you uh, are our first partners. Yes. Uh, and, and, uh, I think the degree of sensitivity they had to our interest in the business uh, was exemplary. So, so, you know, we can come on this stage and say what we want to say, but uh, hand on my heart, I can, I can vouch for, for the way the business is being run. Um, just, you know, switching gears a little bit, and you talked a little bit about the AI element of it, right? Um, and, you know, one of our ambitions as businesses is to go to underserved pockets of buyers, suppliers, uh, right? At some level, we are building startups, but we are also building a nation, right? Um, now, unfortunately, I think uh, the best AI technologies are very, very opaque, yeah. right? You don't know what's going on. You don't know what's going on, right? The outcome is fine, right? But what new form of exclusion are they creating, right? Uh, those are hard to guess. Um, any um, kind of broad guardrails that are beginning to develop uh, that you look at when you're deploying these kind of technologies? Yeah, so I would, I'll probably sound very leftist or socialist when I say this, but I think the, the big debate uh, that's happening in AI is whether AI will take away jobs and all that, right? So I think one of the guardrails that I'm very close to, because I think businesses only scale if they have true social impact, is that if you are taking in AI for efficiency that finally is resulting in job erosion, even in the short term, then likely we'll not adopt it. So uh, if it's, for example, I mean, one of the most recent examples that we've had is that we could easily uh, use a very AI-led interactive voice response systems to actually uh, replace some of our telecallers. And it was damn cheap. 
uh, it was almost at a cost that was close to about 18 to 20 percent of what was being deployed on a through cycle basis on a monthly or a week or, or a quarterly basis. Uh, but we didn't go for it uh, because we thought that um, this is our social responsibility uh, and we should not be uh, moving away from it. Similarly, the second thing that comes to my mind is uh, as I think about AI, um, a lot of data privacy uh, issues come up because I, I, we have one of, uh, you know, one of the most used B2B products in India called a platform called Bid Assist through which we get a lot of marketing data of anybody who comes in there. He's incentivized to give in a lot of data and he gets some data in exchange. So it's a very powerful product which causes a lot of engagement and data exchange. So there is this incentive of actually crawling that data to actually make them into models of uh, monetization which uh, the customer or, or the guy the, who's giving the data is, is probably not going to be privy to. And finally, uh, the output will be such that he may not even recognize that he contributed to that. We've resisted from that. Because I think, uh, again, uh, the risk of actually going for that monetization is really going to, I mean, uh, it's something that can really mar your business. So those are the kind of things that we've stayed away from. Uh, you know, I do have more questions for Ashish, but if there are questions in the audience, I want to make sure we take them as we go along. So I'm just going to give a pause here. Yeah, I think there's one at the back. Did you raise your hand for the question? No. Okay. Yeah, here. Hi. Hi, ma'am. Would love to have your name first. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Garima. I'm a part of uh, Team CA. <laughs> So I've heard uh, no, Ruchi in the past, and now it's a pleasure uh, hearing you uh, from the same stage. Uh, uh, and Alok also had uh, brought the whole point of you being somebody who has built a successful business, which is not just for a limelight, but actually the business, which is uh, no, generating money. So would like to hear your thoughts on what's the recipe of success. Uh, what's the recipe you? of the success? Yeah. So I'll tie it <laughs> to, the, to, the, to the responsibility theme. Okay. And to the fractures that uh, Alok was talking about. See, if you look at us, we think about um, the responsibility of our, ourselves to the ecosystem in a, in a spectrum, right? Uh, and that spectrum is actually so core to us that it permeates to almost every single level in the organization, howsoever lower. I think the, the first is around compliance. So everybody has to do some kind of, you know, there are some rules that govern everything. It's very clearly stated, you f see those rules, follow those rules. If you don't uh, follow those rules, obviously you don't stand as a business. That's very basic, right? The next part of the spectrum is actually to have governance. Governance is when they are not rules, but this is something that you've committed, likely in writing, to other members of the ecosystem. It could be investors, it could be lenders, it could be suppliers, it could be partners like Alok was to us, it could be to employees and stuff like that, and you follow them to a T. That's governance. Again, in our opinion, very basic. Uh, the third is ethics. Ethics is when you've not committed that to anybody, but you are bound by values and rules and norms that you've made for yourselves or for your organizations internally. Right? It is when you become an ethical organization that it becomes truly something that you can, you know, stand for. Organizations like Tata as a whole, they stand for it. Infosys as a whole, they stand for it. Many, many organizations are true to ethics or values that they have drafted for themselves and they follow it internally. But the fourth and in our opinion is the, is the spectrum around, the spectrum actually exists, uh, exi exists there is morals. Morals is where individuals have actually drafted certain rules for themselves. It may not be true for the organization as a whole, but individuals have created uh, for themselves to behave externally. When you have very many people who actually exhibit morals that are more personalized to them and your organization is full of those moral peoples, you really, really uh, stand out as an organization. I think as an organization, we are somewhere, somewhere in that spectrum between, I would say, two and three, which is between uh, governance and ethics. But we are very conscious of this spectrum, and we are trying to move as rightward or as upward in the spectrum as possible as we go ahead. And I think that particular responsibility that we have to the ecosystem shows up in the trust that people have in us, shows up in... Uh, for example, the trust actually shows up in, for example, in lenders that will lend to us without guarantees. Um, investors will believe the plans that we give. Employees will take a bet on the future and not ask for much in the short term and stuff like that. I think that at the core 
is something that we all believe in and having started uh, on the right side of 30, which is way beyond 30, I started when I was 35, kind of helped. I think the 15 years of work X before that helped. So I would say core recipe, particularly on this responsibility theme, amongst many others is that. Uh, hi, Ashish. Good evening. Uh, I'm Bandhan. And uh, I wanted to ask if you could go deeper into becoming the house. So I want to underst uh, understand it in a uh, more depth. Have you heard of this concept that the gambler yeah, may or yeah. may not win? Yeah, yeah. But the house always wins because yes. the house always charges a fee, yes. right? Like you see in the gaming thing of today, the house is the government. It charges 28% on the pot. It will always win, <laughs> right? So, so there are. So you have to be the house. The, when when I talk about a marketplace, basically means that you are trying to be the house, which means that you are charging. The pro is that you are charging a fee on whatever is being played on every single transaction on every single value add that you are doing, okay? But at the same time, what do you have to ensure that so that the house remains stable is the fact that it is actually true as a marketplace. Marketplaces in the truest form, okay, is are efficient in nature, one. Efficient means that if somebody comes in with a, uh, with a lower price or a lower, uh, or a lower uh, feature that really matters, he actually wins, right? So they should be efficient. They should be healthy in nature, like, it should not be that one person should be winning everything. It should be uh, typically diversified and stuff. And three, it should always evolve with time, meaning that more and more features are getting added and all that. So if you have to be a house, as long as you can be true to all these features, you're building a true marketplace. And hence, there will be more and more participants in the marketplace. Participants will typically see value because when they come to the marketplace, they're likely getting the best that they can get. And you always earn your fee. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Thank you. A uh, couple of questions here in the front. My name is Varun. I wanted to ask you, uh, how do you Amazon proof your business? How do you? Amazon proof your business. Amazon uh, proof your business. Amazon. So, uh, the reality is, in our case, Amazon has a tough time to get into. In fact, it is true for most of the uh, marketplaces. Uh, the reason being that we are into bulky raw material commodities, which actually are delivered on credit. So Amazon always makes you pay in advance, right? So fundamentally, there is this screen of saying that if you have to get into B2B marketplaces, you have to master credit. Okay, so that's one big screen. As long as they can solve for that, they can, they can uh, get into it. But the reality is, the only way in which Amazon can solve, because they don't want to get into credit as a philosophy, is that if they do a partnership. If they do a partnership, fundamentally, the model fails because of a variety of reasons. Okay, uh, there are some pockets in which it has been successful, but more importantly, what happens is when a partnership is struck, if the partnership goes very well, then the marketplace actually eats up the business or the margins of the, of the financier, and the financier al always looks for a very high utilization in the marketplace, which he typically doesn't get. So I think that one big barrier in B2B kind of has prevented Amazon from being very large. Like for example, if you look at it, Amazon uh, business, is a Amazon B2B offering. It's actually quite large in the US. Okay, I, if I'm not wrong, I, it, last year it was somewhere between six to eight percent of their entire revenue pool, including Amazon Web Services. But in India, it is very, very small. The reason it hasn't taken off is because of this credit element. So we are lucky to be in a country where Organized. Indianized credit is, is prevalent. Thank you. Uh, was there a question there? Yeah, on the right. Hi, Ashish. Um, can you speak about how you are going to create defensibility around ONDC? You spoke about, you know, making your business Amazon proof. But how are you dealing with ONDC? Also, Very if you can, uh, you know, double click on the policy of not making m a profit more than a certain percentage, that would help. So, ONDC is again credit. Huh. At, at, see, at a very fundamental level, I know there are some people working towards it and may may actually swing it to the other side and make it uh, really prevalent. But reality is partnerships of ecosystems and financiers in India fundamentally has not worked. Unless, uh, you know, Alok is trying hard towards it. And if it works, it will probably take away this massive USP that we have, right? But even in ONDC, they can't give stuff out on credit. There is a financier on the platform, 
but the financier to actually integrate by using technology and understanding the customer behavior and granularizing it to an effect that it is personalized for every single transaction of the customer is tough. That today is the barrier. And we are playing well within that barrier, right? So that's the answer to ONDC. Uh, your question was, why do we have a certain percentage? Is that, is that the, the question? The policy of not making per commission more than a certain percentage at off business. You See, mentioned. it comes simply from two things. One is the fact that, you know, there is a fundamental deep-seated belief, and I see it in almost every large business, that unless you are making social impact beyond a certain level, you actually can't scale your business to great heights. Right? And the way to make social impact in a commercial business like ours, where the guy is buying from you typically because it's cheap and on time, or taking credit from you because it's cheaper than his other alternative, is that you keep giving him benefits with time. And hence, you are making more and more social impact. I think that, number one, is the driver around the fact that uh, we don't want to make beyond a certain percentage and manage our costs rather than the revenue yield. That's point number one. The second driver of this uh, point is the fact that, you know, there will always be a rainy day. No, you are, you are going for a listing, you, you are seeing your uh, next quarter results, dropping, then what do you do? You should always have quick wins in your pocket. You should always have the ace that you can actually go towards. It's like when your parents were, when you're growing up, your parents would say, hey, always do your saving because tomorrow you may be out of a job. It's that ace that we are holding on to ourselves because that, that is a very quick win that we can, that's a very easy lever to pull so that you can actually get your business unit economics up, right? So the resistance uh, is discipline which you can use later. Uh, Ashish, uh, you know, uh, as we are, and you know, a, as a nation we are building unicorns and big startups and so on, there is this worrying trend that with some degree of regularity there are governance lapses, frauds, right, that are appearing up. Now, many of the places where these have cropped up are perfectly good founders, right? They're, these are good people trying to build a good business, but somewhere uh, down the slippery slope or, you know, in the midst of uh, misplaced incentives. Uh, what advice would you have for entrepreneurs in the room on how to view that, uh, you know, and where to start stemming that? Well, all of us at some point will have a temptation to say, you know, this is a small slip and doesn't really matter till it becomes too big. Uh, just, I would love to, for you to kind of talk to our entrepreneurs and give them some guideposts of how to make sure that they stay on the right path. Yeah. So, again, it comes to belief systems, it comes to where you were born, how you grew up and stuff like that, right? So, if you've already slipped, God help you, but if not slipped, this is a good mantra for you to follow. <laughs> so, um, the big seated belief that you need to have within yourself is that if you fall for anything that is tempting, it's like cheating in an exam, you will hurt only yourself in the long term. And the bigger you get, the higher the chances that somebody around you is watching that and will make sure that it is harming. You have to have this deep-seated belief within yourself. And that's step number one. The moment you have this belief, you should make sure that you talk about it and make sure that almost everybody in and around you is aware that they should also have the same belief. The, that's step number two. Step number three is that once you, you will definitely see in the organization somebody falling on the wayside because he's not probably following that deep-seated belief to a T. Then, you have to make sure that you don't forgive him at all and you are as ruthless as you can be. That's step number three. Step number four is that whatever you do in your ruthless mode, you have to make sure that it is remembered forever. Because if the belief systems or the fear of God didn't work, at least the stick will work. So that's step number four. Step number five is that you have to make sure that if somebody has actually displayed that belief and probably, you know, given away some short-term gains just to stand for that belief, he's celebrated to as big a total 
as you can imagine. He's like literally uh, stood for something very core to the organization. In my belief, as long as you are staying true to these five and you keep doing all over and over again, and you are so vocal about it, it will stop you from falling for that temptation because you will be self-contradicting yourself from what you've probably spoken or written about, right? I think just being vocal about it. Because my fundamental belief is the moment you speak a lot about something, you become that. So one has to be very, very vocal and make sure he, people around him are the same. So that's the mantra that I, I choose to follow and I believe um, something that really catches like uh, wildfire. Ashish, thanks so much for a great conversation. I'm sure our audience enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, in, in a week where all of us are feeling so proud of being Indians, uh, I think we will build uh, an entrepreneurial ecosystem that we feel equally proud about. So thank you so much for spending your time with us. It's been a great conversation. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thank you, Alok. We wish to present the panelists a token of appreciation from Thai. Please stay back.